Hello and welcome to Manticore. I'm Steve and uh, this is my comic channel where I explore what's in my attic and uh, it won't always be that so um, this can't kind of go on forever because uh, there will come a point where I finish exploring what's in my attic and then the podcast will become about what I do with all this stuff that I find on my attic which is broadly comics. I mean there will be a point where I get onto kind of board games and card games and collectibles and things because that's all in the attic too but uh, the comics that's what I'm focusing on and uh, I've got to tell you I've, I've had a, a bit of a day today because um I was in, most of the day I spent sitting in a a, a fairly arduous meeting. Um, you know, I don't mind, that's the job in it and I enjoy doing it and it's okay to do it. But um, having discovered my kind of passion for comics um, over the last month or two, um, I was sitting there towards, as the meeting kind of ground on and it was getting close to the end of the day, I was th I kept thinking about my pile that I've got to come back here, my pile of comics to sort and uh, the more that I could get down from the left loft and uh, a bit obsessed with it at the minute, if I'm honest. Um, and also, I've, I also design games for a living, so I've got quite a lot of work to do on that as well. Um, not any that you'll particularly have heard of, really, but um, but we'll get to that another time. Anyway, I've been going through it and I've, I've found some cool stuff today. But first of all, I had a box which had got quite damaged first of all um at some point it got a bit damp so there was some water damage not too much but some um but the big problem was that they kind of been moved around the comics in the box and they'd all fallen at weird angles and they'd been stuck for a decade or more in a position a bent position and so they had like a hundreds of comics had like a, a crease in them that very hard to get rid of you can get them pressed and stuff but they, these aren't valuable comics most of them luckily they weren't a box full of very valuable ones it was kind of run-of-the-mill Green Lanterns and Teen Titans and um, Incredible Hulks and none, I didn't find anything there of big value but it's a bit it's a bit frustrating. I, looking back now on it I kind of wish I'd been a bit more careful but you know when you've kind of move on with your life and comics fall behind and they go up in the loft it's sort of out of sight out of mind and it's not until you start getting them out and think oh what have I done with some of them but luckily most of the collection is holding up well. So um found so many good things today i've had a bit of a run of cool things today i've got a bunch here put aside from this most late, latest box beside me <coughs> some of it's cool because i like it some of it's cool because it's worth some money uh, let's just see what you think so first of all um i found a pile of hitmans um now uh hitman is a, a well-known garth ennis run garth ennis is a famous writer of comics if you're a comic fan you'll know garth ennis um if you're not a comic writer fan you may have encountered some of the things garth ennis has done um He's, he writes a very kind of a gritty feeling comic. There's a, it's kind of really, there's, there's over the top violence. Um, it's quite often realistic or adult mature themes. Um, a lot of humour. Uh, there's a, quite a lot of stuff is what I would call a British style. And um, Hitman was a, probably my favourite. I mean, I like lots of Garth Ennis stuff, if I'm honest. But Hitman was just such a good comic. And it ran for 50 or 60 issues. And I... It was sold really well for a long time, and then I don't know what happened at the end. I don't know if it stopped selling and that's why they ended it, or if Garth Ennis just decided he didn't want to keep telling the story, but he brought the whole thing to a close. And he brought it to a close by, well, killing off Hitman. And uh, it was it was quite sad, you know, because you got to know all these characters, and, and, and then they, they kind of went out in a blaze of glory at the end, like um, uh, a famous movie, which I... I'm so old now, you know, I just forget things that will go out of my mind. But um, whatever it was, famous movie, it will come back to me in a minute. Um, but they kind of emulated that scene where they kind of come out all guns blazing and get gunned down by hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of the enemy, which I, th I think was... Um, I've got a feeling it was... I, I think it was uh, the... the British SAS actually was that one that was the SAS or was that a bit before that I forget whoever the bad guys they weren't bad guys but whoever the enemy of Hitman were because Hitman was an anti-hero he was an assassin basically but it was an assassin with a conscience and um, he didn't have a lot of powers he's, he's Hitman he was already a very good assassin before he got any powers but his powers were basically his, he had x-ray eyes <laughs> but somehow Garth Ennis made the most fantastic series of stories out of this he encountered all sorts of weirds and weird and wonderful people along the way. But I found these. Why this is interesting is because I already have my Hitman comics. Now, that's one of the ones that haven't been in the loft. I, I have some comics, ones I really love, in a kind of a little display unit in my house. And there they've been saved. So I've got the entire run of Hitman. So these are extra copies of Hitman, which is nice because it'd be nice to be able to sell these to someone and let someone else discover um, how wonderful Hitman is. It's such a good... Look, if you've not read Hitman, and, and you like that kind of more gritty 
feel to a story, um, but with some humour and you know really good characters, then I can't reckon I re recommend Hit Hitman more. Okay, so then I discovered this. This is the Unmen. Get your freak on, and um, this has got good rails. People have been telling me this is good, and so I don't know how or when I bought it, but I bought it at some point. And I don't really know what the story is about, but the art is just absolutely brilliant. Let me just show you a splash page. Uh, again, if you're under the age of 18, look away at this point. But uh, here's a, this splash page here. I don't know how much you can see, but... I mean, that is just fantastic, isn't it? And um, it's all really good. It's, it's just... I, I've no idea. People tell me this story is great. So this one, I'm going to keep this one aside and, uh, and have a read of it. And I'll probably keep this in my collection, I would imagine. So, in fact, it's a Vertigo graphic novel um so then uh, i i got this one this is brave and the bold batman and adam strange the reason uh, i'm telling you about this is adam strange is another character i really really like and uh, much like i i said i was going to do with dead man uh, my intention is to try and collect every appearance of adam strange that's going to be one of the ones i keep i like that kind of pulpy adam strange is a kind of a He's, he's a human with he's a bit like Flash Gordon. He's a human with no powers. He's just got a ray gun. He gets the ability to teleport to another planet called Van, uh, where he kind of makes a home and falls in love. Um, and although they're much more futuristic on Van than they are on Earth, his um, his characteristics make him turn him into a hero, and he gets a jetpack. So he ends up being able to fly around with a ray gun. And that kind of old pulp style, rocketeer style. I just like it, and uh, and I love his costume. He's got a brilliant costume. Um, now this is new. I've just I've just bought this actually because uh, I'm a big fan of an artist called Frank Cho. Um, he's a bit lefty for me, to be honest with you, politically. But um, but I love his stories and I love his art. And he draws fantastic looking, particularly fantastic looking women. Uh, his characters are really great. Um, and everybody's saying this was a good book. And I I've got a lot of his stuff. His university stuff, which is like talking animals and good looking ladies. But this is called the Book of Outrage. And I've got a good deal on this one. I was pleased to pick it up. This will not be being sold again. This is staying in my collection. I'm trying to find some pictures I can show you because some of them are a bit, well, they're all a bit risque, but some of them are really quite funny. Um, what do I like? Let me just, there was a couple that really made me laugh. Mm -mm -mm. You just you just wait there while I look, okay? <laughs> um, I like this Wolverine. Just uh, He's absolutely full of arrows. And he's saying, OK, Bob, now it's my turn. <laughs> OK, Bob. And look, I love it. He's got a good sense of humour, Frank Cho. He's, he's funny. Uh, most of his, he, he draws women like this. Very, very attractive women. Um, always with humour. And, and the, the, the women are always strong women with interesting characters. They're not just pretty girls, uh, but they are always pretty girls, as far as I can see, when Frank Cho draw, draws them. Uh, here he's got an amazing Spider-Man talking to what appears to be Vampirella, and it's a kind of a spoof cover. Spider-Man offering her some of his Aunt May's wheat cakes, and they're saying, no thanks, sir. I'm on a liquid diet. <laughs> um, some of this stuff is really good. So uh, he's got a, a take of Lady Death here, who I showed you yesterday. And uh, this uh, other character, a chaos character, whose name I forget. Life is so unfair, I wish I had big boobs. And Lady Death says, uh, oh, tell me what this, getting you in the right place. Uh, you will. <laughs> She's a comic book character drawn by Frank Cho. It's going to happen. Um, but the art is just absolutely brilliant. I mean, and the humour is great. I really like it. It's just a series of kind of uh, sketch pieces, really. But I like that. Keeping that one. Um, I found this. I wanted to show you this. Look, this is The Defenders. This is an old copy of The Defenders. Now, I'm going to bring it close. Look in the letters of The Defenders. I think I did that when I was a kid. I think, for some bizarre reason, I've decided to pen the words in between. What a stupid thing to do. Um, this must have been... God knows. Or maybe it wasn't me. Maybe I picked it up second hand from a jumble sale or something because I used to do that when I was a kid. I looked for comics in jumble sales. So maybe I'm not to blame for this. Maybe I'm not the guilty party. But uh, what a terrible thing to do to a Defenders comic. I like the Defenders. They were uh, an old um, Marvel super team. Uh, you know, the, the sort of like back then there was a bunch of them. There were the champions, which are some of the X Men, and a few of the others. But the Defenders was cool. It was um, they had a, a sort of a rotating cast, but they had tend to have the Hulk, Valkyrie, um, Hellcats, and uh, Night. I forget Night something Night. 
not Nightcrawler, um, Nighthawk. Nighthawk, that was his name. Um, look at this giant monster. So this is um, this is a graphic novel and a really good looking graphic novel. Let me show you some of the art in this. Look at this beast. If I can just kind of show you it. That is amazing, isn't it? Look at the just fan all the way through the art in this is brilliant. I've not read it, so this is something for me to read. Um, can't remember. This is this isn't that old. This was near the front of the loft. So this is something I bought less long ago than this stuff was stored and just got put in the loft with other stuff when you as you do you know you, every time you do a rearrangement of the house all the stuff you don't know where to put it up it goes into whatever available space which is often the loft I've got this um, this one here uh, which is also in the fairly new stuff I think 2011 this is from so this isn't from my really old stored stuff Twisted Dark now look at that that's a beefy old graphic novel and it's mint condition I've clearly never read it and I don't remember buying it so um how did I come by that? I don't know. It's an interesting book, though. Really good-looking book. Okay. Now, um, this we start getting into some of the interesting ones. So I was, I was going through a bunch of. I had a bunch of Mark Spector Moon Knights. Here's a Mark Spector Moon Knight, and it turns out that this one has got some value. It's thirty or forty quid for it, and it's a it's a special issue, Death in the Family. Um, so I'm guessing it was a pivotal moment. Um, of the plot it was almost at the end of the run before they cancelled the comic and quite often the last two or three in a run increase in value but this stood out against all the others with its value checked it on ebay it's not going for as much on ebay as as comic base says it's worth but it's still going for significant money um i've got mighty man here now the reason i'm keeping mighty man is it, it's a uh, part of the characters that created with the by eric larson and i really like eric larson now he's um, some people take a mixed view of him but i his, his art and his storytelling I just like it, it's just grand his most famous character is a character called Savage Dragon which is the longest running comic book continuously published by the same artist or something, same author, I forget but um, he's been going for a long time and I used to collect Savage Dra Dragon and I think I'm going to dig those ones out when I, I've not reached those yet my, I've picked up a couple but I don't know where the bulk of my Savage Dragon collection is I've got about 80 of them somewhere but um, when I come across that I'm going to keep all the Savage Dragons and then all of the Eric Larson spin-off books that were characters that affect Savage Dragon. So, um, I, don't, I must I don't actually know that Eric Larson did this, so I'm going to have a look. Uh, I know that Mighty Man was in Savage Dragon, but he may have used the character someone else made. So, And sure enough, the, the pencil is not him. So Mighty Man was clearly one of the other Image Guys characters that Eric Larson would use in his books. Um, but I'm still going to keep them. If, if they appeared in Savage Dragon, I'm going to add them to my Savage Dragon collection. And uh, that will be good. That's my plan. Anyway, I'm just telling you the ones on the way that I plan to keep. So I'm going to keep several thousand comics at the end of all this. So I don't know why, but this, Rise of Apocalypse, this is worth some money. Now, there was, it's, it's a mini-series, and most of the ones in the mini-series aren't worth much, but this is worth 30 or 40 quid. And having checked it on, on eBay, again, it's not selling for quite as much as Comic Base says, but it's still significant what it's selling for. So um, don't know why, but that's a good one to have found. Then I found a bunch of these Kabooms. Kaboom? Never read Kaboom, I don't know if you've read Kaboom. Uh, it's, um, who is it? Uh, the awesome brand, which I think it's something to do with um, Image again, but I'm not sure of that. I'm absolutely sure, just trying to see. But also Entertainment, they were their own brand. This comic um, is well critically thought about, and the first issue is, again, this one. It's worth 30 or 40 quid. And um, same applies with eBay and stuff, but uh, it's nice to be picking up the other ones are only worth a couple of quid, but the first one is worth some money. So then I came across this. Now, this is packed up from when I had the comic shop. This is Batman 404, the first part of Death in the Family, um, which is the first episode of Year One. So Batman, they, they kind of did a period where they went back and they talked about how Batman very first started. They reimagined it a little bit. And told the story of his first year becoming how it started and how he became Batman again, right into way into the Batman comic. Um, and then there was year two and year three, and they were all critically successful, very well written by Frank Miller, fantastic, fantastic writer. And um, I, I obviously, when I had the comic shop, had all, all four of the year one comics, four comics make up year one parts one, two, three, and four. So I've bagged them together here, and there's a little label saying Batman year one, whole set of four, and I was selling them at the time for £18 the set which, thinking back on it, was probably a bit pricey in the time, but isn't pricey now. 
um, I would say that set is worth probably a good 30 quid now in that condition, possibly more. Um, so then this was an interesting one. So then I came across these um, these Pitt comics. Now I remember Pitt. I remember it coming out in the 90s and I remember seeing it and I remember picking up a few and, but these are mostly ones I think I had in my comic shop. You can tell by the price on the front. Here's an interesting thing. These um, contain scenes of horror violence, it says at the bottom. Well, good. Um, it turns out that these pits have got some value. Um, they, they've held up well. They're worth more than your average comic. And I've got quite a few of them. So that's looking good. I've checked some prices out. They seem to hold up. They've obviously got a good collector base. And there's not enough of them around to satisfy demand. So the price is pushed up. Um, uh, that's boring. Right, so here's a good one. So I found, um, I've got a few of these as well, but this is Johnny the Homicidal Maniac. Now, um, JTHM, abbreviated, um, was a real cult hit, a massive cult hit. Uh, I really like it, actually. It's, it's a really interesting, cleverly, witty, well-dialogued story, and it's it's really worth a read. Really interesting. I've got, but I've got the um, collected book so I don't need the individual ones I've got um, a couple of number sevens but then I've got number two number five or a couple of others um, and they've all got good value they, they've held up but this number seven in particular has it um, has held its value really well it's worth 30 or 40 quid so here's another one um, Max is another one of these creator owned characters I think uh, and this is an image comic uh, that seem to have held their value very well and I've got loads of these and looking online they're all worth you know, 20 quid, 30 quid, and they're selling. They've got a, clearly got a good collector base. Now, it might not be that I come to sell them and I can't get those sort of prices, but um, I'm excited by the kind of pile of them that I've got, and I think I've got about, oh, well, I know I've got at least twice much more than this in another box somewhere, because I remember. Um, they're all in brilliant condition, no damage to any of them, and uh, they sell really well. And I will be selling those. I, it's fantastically critically acclaimed. It's... Um, it's to do with it's something to do with a imaginary friend or something of a little girl, uh, but it, it gets quite dark the story, and I think the girl's been abused. If I'm right about what that story is, but it was kind of a, um, a very thoughtful, deep story at a time when a lot of things were whoosh and bam, and you know, so that was good. I found this. This is Night of the Living Dead. The uh, and it appears oh, just the art. Right, so I, as I told you before, I like poppy art, but there's, there are times when I really like this kind of gritty. Look at this. Zombies, I think, are really served well by this kind of dark, black and white, moody look. I'll try and find a good page for you. Uh, this, is the, this is clearly the um, graphic novelisation of the movie, because I, I recognise the story. Um, you see, I can see the individual panel panels look great, but I think perhaps it doesn't... I don't know if you're going to see how good it looks, but it's just fantastic. I love it. Really cool. It's just a cool thing to own, particularly since another passion of mine is zombie movies. So, um, I'm not selling that. <laughs> um, okay, so this is Avalon, The Legacy of Thrain. Now... Um, Avalon was put out by a company called Kenzo and & Company and they um, used to do a, a very popular comic called Knights of the Dinner Table and it was a kind of a spoof of um, role playing games uh, and uh, it was a very it had a lot of love in it so it, it was um, it didn't it, it wasn't taking the mick in a nasty way of role playing games the people who wrote these comics understood people who play tabletop role playing games understood what made, made them tick understood what, what they love understood everything about that and turned it into a comic which was both about the characters they played and the people who played them and all of that kind of circle of friends. Uh, I don't know if it's still going, but it went for a very long time. And given that the art was quite basic and often reused, so they would use a picture of a guy and then they'd just rotate his head for the next scene. It didn't it was, I'm sure that was quite a cheap way of making a comic. But the stories were just fantastic. Well, this was one of the comics put out by them. Now, they've gone on to make... Um, actual role-playing games now and they make a lot of money making role-playing games they spun off from their comic which took the kind of exaggerated role-playing games and made an exaggerated role-playing game which is now doing really well called I think Pathfinder um, now this I didn't ever get this but I looked and it's got some value I don't know why something about this comic has got some value it's in brilliant condition I will sell that one okay so this is the flash Certainly one of my top five favourite superheroes of all time, The Flash. I love The Flash. Love the original 
1970s Silver Age Barry Allen Flash. I like them all. I like Wally West and uh, and I like all the spin-offs like um, like uh, Impulse I enjoyed and uh, the kind of the Kid Flash and the Teen Titans, which was Wally and others. Um, I just really liked it. Oh, I made a mistake in yesterday's um, episode, issue, podcast, program. Um, I said, when I was talking about the Teen Titans, that Speedy was the Flash sidekick. That is a rookie error, and I'm completely wrong. Speedy was actually Green Arrow's sidekick, and he fired arrows. I Obviously, Speedy, you think of speed, that's why I said it, but I was wrong. And I realised that when I was, I watched it back, and I went, ah, oh, that's completely wrong, Steve. I don't know if anybody knows that and was screaming at the screen. I'd love to think someone was. Anyway, I digress. Um, so uh, this is not one of the original Silver Age comics. I wish it were. I've got some of them, but they're in much worse condition than this. This is in great condition, but it's because it's a reprint. Uh, you know, I wish they'd reprint them all. I wish they would They would reprint them all. I, I think they did a bit of that in this, but I'd like to see it happen again. All the old classic Silver Age and even older Bronze Age comics. How cool would that be? Uh, just get on and reprint them. People will buy them, I'm sure. I've got to, I've got to say, I, I don't think that the comic industry has fared well in the last few years. Um, something has happened to it and there's still some good stuff but they all just seem to be chasing the next movie now and uh, the movies are fun but sometimes a bit derivative not all of them some are clever but not not all of them um i don't know i just i go and i look in comic shops now and i struggle to find stuff that i want to buy they often look great you know, the covers look great they've got interesting designs but i don't know there seems to be a, a fascination with turning everyone into a into a woman who was a man and uh, every, every white character becomes a black character but there were already so many great female and black characters in comics I don't understand the need to mess around with classic heroes not that I've got anything wrong with it happening if it works for the story then that's great but I don't understand this obsessive need to do it you do, and perhaps those of you who haven't read comics realise but there are so many of it that it's happening to now and it seems to be accelerating and I would prefer them to write new stories about, you know, if they want to have more diverse range of characters, and I stress, comics has never really suffered from that. But if they want to have a more diverse range, write some cool new ones. There's never, so many cool new ideas. There are so many types of people out there. You don't need to to score some points or whatever against whomever just by, by doing something to these old classic characters. Anyway, I'm not going to get on a rant about that because I'll start sounding like I do like comic skate, but. That's not what this comic. This that's not what this channel is about. Um, okay, so, cave woman. Another one of those kind of scantily clad females. But cave woman was a nice was a nice storytelling. I used to enjoy it, and uh, and and she was an interesting character. And they developed her. Another one. They haven't held their value very well though. And then uh, maximum presses dark child. Avert your eyes if you're young. Mind you, not too much shown, but. Um, there you go, and another one of these comics that seems to mainly sell on the fact that it had a very attractive um, lead woman casting it. And they did a lot of that at the time. I guess when you're selling to nerds, that's what happens. And I, I include myself in the in the name. Um, this was an interesting one. This uh, Uncanny Origins, The Black Cat. ATP that was when I used to sell it in the shop. I've got, actually got two identical ones of it because they were ex stock from the shop. And... Um, these are kind of uncanny origins featuring, they have a different character each time, they run for a while. They, I, they never really seem to have any much value at all. And they don't hold value because they're not an ongoing story, they're just like little pop shots. But for some reason this, Black Cat 1 and Black Cat 1 alone, is that worth a tenner each or something? No idea why. There must be a reason. Uh, maybe you know. Um, boring, boring. Uh, what have we got here? Right, so here's Sabretooth. Back to nature, X-Men fans, Wolverine fans will know Sabretooth as kind of Wolverine's arch enemy, occasional ally. Um, comic Base didn't have this one, as far as I could find it. I, they seem to have, they've got millions of comics that you don't, you struggle to find things they haven't got. They've got some of the most obscure indie titles you could imagine, but Sabretooth Back to Nature I could not find. I looked in all the Sabretooths, because sometimes the specials or graphic novels are at the bottom of the list. I looked specifically for this one, can't find it, so... Um, it sells for 15 or 20 quid on eBay, so good. Won't be, I will be selling that one. Then I found this. There's another one that Comic Base didn't have. This is 
Clandestine versus the X-Men. Now, Clandestine were a big team for a while, an independent one, but quite a big one. And, um, or were they Marvel? I forget. I forget, actually, if I'm honest. But they, they cross on with the X-Men here, anyway. And uh, this is a great-looking book. I mean, let me just show you the whole thing. And it, it's thick. Look, it's a that's a beefy graphic novel. That's really it's weighty. It's a significant book. The art is brilliant. The characters look great. It's got the X-Men in it. Can't find it on um, on Comic Base anywhere. I have no idea if it's... Well, it must be worth something. But it's a really heavy graphic novel, and it looks good. I will sell it, but... Uh, Good, it's good. Right, what, what's next on our pile today? Do, 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 do. Oh yeah, so um, when I was opening my first box, I was pleased to find the first and second issues of Deadpool because they are worth some money and they're in mint condition and uh, uh, the first one is worth £100 plus and the second one, 40 quid or something. Um, a bit less for the eBay prices, but they definitely have some significant value more than your £2, which most of my comics are worth. Um, but then I came across another pile of Deadpools. I've got uh, number 13, um, 213, two 11s, and a 10. And I know there's more because I said I got mixed up there. I'm sure there's going to be another 20 or so. And all of these are worth 20 or 30 quid each because Deadpool is so hot right now. Because everybody loves Deadpool, don't they? And the first kind of comic series has held its value and increased its value really well. I will be selling these. I like Deadpool, but I've got some graphic novels, and that's good enough for me. I'm not an absolute fanatic for Deadpool. And then I came across this. I really like this. So another one of my top favourite characters of all time is Rorschach from The Watchmen. And look, it's a little Rorschach Lego man. <laughs> so uh, that's that's going to go on my shelf with my with my Watchmen collection. I've got a whole. I'm keeping all of them. So I've got all the comics and all the graphic novels and the ultimate hardbound graphic novel with all the variations in it. I've got loads of, and, all, and then the, the new stories that they brought out and um, obviously uh, the crossover into the DC universe that's happened fairly recently, Doomsday Clock, got all them as well. They're all gonna go on one display with my little, my little Rorschach, Lego man. I need to get some more modelly things as well to make the shelves look better. I don't really collect models, but you can have a shelf with loads of different titles on it. You ought to have some models on there too, I, I just think. Um, yeah, so I've got lots of Ghost Rider. I think I've got virtually this whole run of Ghost Rider. Um, I don't know why. I, I, I quite like that Ghost Rider, but I never really collected it. But for some reason, I've got them all. And, um, and this one is worth some money. Now, this is the final issue when apparently Ghost Rider gets married. And it's it's worth 20 or 30 quid. So that's cool, isn't it? Um, doo -doo -doo. Now, this is a special one. Now, let me show you what I've got here. Dun, dun, dun. Action Comics number one. Lots of people are laughing right now. Those who know what, what they're doing. But this, sadly, is not the real Action Comics number one. Because if this were the real Action Comics number one, I could clear my mortgage. That's the money that a comic at a mint condition like this of Action Comics number one is worth. Just, you know, a lot of money. Tens of thousands of pounds. Possibly, I don't know, it might be worth hundreds of thousands, certainly 30 or 40,000 pounds. It's worth a lot of money, This, if I had this. This, uh, sadly, is a reprint that they did in the 90s just for you to have on display. But you put it up on display and some people go, oh, you've got Action Comics number one. Yeah, sure I have. <laughs> okay, so um, then I found a, a pile of these. Um, Epic Magazine. Uh, I've got about 50 of these. And um, and also the other one, um, Heavy Metal. I've got about 30 or 40 of those as well. They're all in reasonable condition, but some of them are a bit dog-eared. Some of them are virtually new, but most of them have got a bit dog-eared because they weren't in bags. They were just in the loft. And they weren't in bags because back then in the 90s, I, I just never used to get the big, the, you need oversized bags. I've got them now, and I will be bagging them. Um, they've, all, they've all held their value real well. They're, most of them are worth 20 or 30 quid each if they're in great condition. These aren't in great condition, so they aren't worth 20 or 30 quid each. But the best thing about these is they, the stories and the art have held up so well. I mean, they really are a good read, uh, particularly Heavy Metal, which is just such an excellent magazine. Okay, finally, uh, that's, so that's all the stuff I'm going to show you today of stuff I've pulled out of the boxes. But I'm going to show you some stuff I've bought now. Um, and this is uh, Comics Gate Indiegogo stuff. So the gist of it is there's um, a bunch of guys who got a bit tired with the current kind of Marvel and DC 
um, industry uh, being very political in their opinion it's all kind of pushing kind of social justice and diversity and kind of left-wing tropes and they uh, anti-trump in america kind of thing and these guys were like you know some of them were very political uh, some of them just didn't want to have politics forced on them all the time and wanted to tell fun stories some of them didn't want to be told they've got to draw ugly women now because it's bad to draw attractive women and th there were various things they were objecting about and so they kind of went it alone there's a whole bunch of them they're called comics gate um mainstream comic creators seem to hate them because i suppose that they would say they don't like their politics but don't like the way they act um, and then the comics gate guys would say well no what they don't like is the fact that we're being quite successful which they are some of them are you know making a lot of money hundreds of thousands tens of thousands hundreds of thousands in some cases a million pounds um, releasing a comic book or a couple of comic books a year and um, it's really interesting they do it through YouTube so they have a channel on YouTube they don't all do that but a lot of them follow this model where they have a channel on YouTube which is very entertaining the classic ones are um, Ethan Van Skyver um, there's a, which is whose, whose channel is called comic book pro secrets look it up it's brilliant um, and then there's uh, your boy Zach which is um, his real name has slipped my mind and it's so annoying because I do know it um, but never mind um, but, and there's a whole bunch of others and, and, and they all make they all kind of have comic book channels which they talk about comics and, and other genre things they're interested in uh, but at the same time they are talented either writers or artists or whatever um, working with others or sometimes on their own to make a comic which they sell through Indiegogo and this model seems to work they produce a book um, uh, they advertise it to their readers, they sell thousands of copies of it, which in some of them are selling co enough copies now to rival the sales of the mainstream market books. Now remember, the mainstream market books can turn out a book a month, and independent creators can turn out a book or two a year at the moment. I'd like to see that change, but that's where they are at the minute. But they, their work, some of them are producing, is just exceptional. And I, I just want to show you a couple. So I would like to show you Cyberfog, which is the Ethan Van Skyver is the is one of the figureheads of the whole comic skate thing, uh, very entertaining guy, really worth watching his channel. But I haven't received my um, my Cyberfog yet because I thought I'd ordered it. Uh, I was always watching his channel, and I just I, I almost got like a Mandela effect where I thought I'd ordered it and I hadn't. And I kept I kept sending a message saying, "Where's my book?" And he was like, "Don't worry, it's on its way." But of course. He, he doesn't look at hunt thousands of people on his list. He just presumes I'm one of the ones waiting to be fulfilled. I wasn't. Um, it turns out I'd never ordered it. So I finally ordered in November a copy of one that was still going, which was the uh, line art variant. And um, they, they'll arrive soon. Probably will arrive in the next week or two. But So I haven't got it yet to show you. I have got some old Ethan Van Skyver stuff because I, I found the 1990s, I think it's Harris Comics, um, Cyber Fogs, which are black and white. Um, they're good. Nice work, and I've, I've got quite a place in my collection, but I won't show you them now. What I will show you is Jawbreakers. And um, Jawbreakers is Richard C. Meyer. Looking at it in the book, that's who your boy Zach, he calls himself your boy Zach on his channel, uh, but, uh, and it's called, um, used to be called Diversity in Comics, and now it's called uh, Comic Books Matter, I'd like to say. Can't remember it offhand. Really sorry if you happen to see this. Uh, Mr. Meyer, I doubt you will, but if you do, I'm sorry. I, I watch every one of his things, but I just, I'll put a link in the in the description. Um, so this is Jawbreakers, and Jawbreakers. Uh, the aim of Richard Meyer was to um, create a book that felt like the '90s. They're a mer they're an, a, a team of mercenaries who are ex superheroes. It's kind of hard edge and gritty. It's got a militaristic feel. The way they work is in a military style, but the stories are very grand. So at one point, they end up finding a giant ape, um, and uh, they pop its eye out. And uh, there's some, there's lots of the kind of. It feels a little bit like, um, like kind of like GI Joe meets um, X Force. I suppose would be the best way to describe it. Um, I absolutely love the grand style of it i love the pop art style i love the way the stories are told it all hangs together well i struggle a little bit to follow the story sometimes he um he kind of presumes you he writes it like there are 50 comics before that you've read um, and he does reveal the information down the line so you've got to be a bit patient and a bit willing to to sit it out um i'm going to show you some of the art that's a 
big double page splash there of the eight. Um, trying to find a good page that will show well on the screen. And so as you can see, the whole style is like a kind of 90s style when image just kind of came to the fore. Um, the art is very good, uh, very, very good. The writing, um, I think, who wrote this one? This was The line art was by John Malian, another of the Comics Gate guys. Um, and then book two, Kelsey Shannon, another one of the Comics Gate guys. Very talented. Uh, it's great. I just really like it. I really like the book. I wouldn't say I loved it. Um, I liked it a lot. Uh, I've read it a couple of times. It's got pride of place in my collection. Um, but the new one, God King... Now that is a step up from the first one. Um, again, it's got that same problem that it presumes you know things you don't. I had to read it several times at the beginning thinking, have I missed something here? Have I missed a page? Is there a, a book I've missed? But there wasn't. It just um, it, 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 it assumes intelligence in the reader, stupidly for me, obviously. But um, And, and it, assume, it assumes a willingness to read a bit deeper than a casual, which is funny because at casual glance it, it presents itself as a pop piece. But it's more than that. And uh, the story is very good. And he's not afraid to kill his characters off. Which is interesting, isn't it? Very Game of thrones -y. And um, this all got a bit Cthulhu uh, by the end, I thought. But great books. Two great books. He's, um, there's another two he's ordered, he's, he's produced. Um, which are not superheroes as far as I can see. I've ordered them both. Um, haven't got them yet. So as soon as they come in, I'll report them. And then I'm loath to do this. But I'm going to do it anyway. So um, one of the comic book guys, a guy called Mike Miller, comic... Uh, one of the um, Comics Gate guys, Mike Miller, has now fallen out with the other Comics Gate guys and kind of gone off and formed his own faction. And um, and I engaged with him a bit on Twitter, actually, when it first happened. And he's another wonderful thing. You can engage with these creators. And they engage right back. You know, you can't... It's pointless trying to do that with big creators. They seem to mostly sneer. or You know, but not all of them. I know I'm being a bit, a bit broad. But these guys are keen to talk and engage to you live on their Facebook, on their YouTube channels, uh, through Twitter or any other means. <clears throat> and I think that's really approachable and that's a really a good model for building a family that then supports you financially when you produce new product. Um, so I'm going to show you Mike Miller's book because it's called Lone Star. And this book I really, really liked. Um, I just thought it was great. It's just, you get these free cards and things in it. Uh, I backed it on Indiegogo like I backed the others. It arrived. Um, I'm, I've also backed the second one, which I'm waiting to come. But I've got to tell you, I'm not going to be backing anymore because he's such a dick. And, and I tried, I don't understand really why. Um, I, these things have always got kind of beef going on in the background and you never really know the whole truth. So you can only go by watching the different content. And almost part of the model of selling these books is the drama and the beef that goes on between the people involved and people picking a side. Well, I've picked a side, and my side is the Ethan Van Skyver side. Um, you know, that, that's I just in, I enjoy their product more. I enjoy the way they engage with the audience more. Uh, I think they've got a better understanding of what comics have got to do in the future, and uh, I, I just gravitated their side. But other people have gone the other way, and over with the Mike S. Miller camp and a bunch of people over there, the Earthworm Jim guy, whose name I forget. He's got some horrible nicknames, so I'm not going to repeat because it's rude. But, um, you know, I, I, all of this is fascinating, isn't it? Because who would have thought that you would get this kind of um, community and community beef that will become part of the sales project for comic books? I think we're seeing a change in comic books, which is going to be modelled in other industries. And uh, I don't know where it's going to go, but I just find it fascinating. Anyway... That's pretty much it for me for today. So um, as usual, you can hear the music again. Talk to you soon.